Okay, students, today we are going to begin our last unit of the semester on art and culture and antiquity, and that section is on Rome. So I'm introducing it through thinking about uh, Rome as a civilization, a city, an empire, uh, historically, and then how Rome features in Virgil's great epic of Rome, the Aeneid. So um, I'm excited for today. Our last unit, it, in a lot of ways, it's very much a culmination of a lot of what we've been discussing all semester. Here are my goals. Um, I first want to reassess heroism in general. This is referring back to the last lecture, thinking about what is a hero in Greek tragedy, what is a hero in epic, um, and how Antigone as a character kind of, kind of bridges this gap between a tragic hero and an epic hero. Um, then I'll do a brief introduction to the history of Rome, uh, its history from a republic to an empire. This is very brief, but it will help to introduce um, the Aeneid. I'll also talk about one of the foundational myths of Rome, which is um, the Romulus and Remus myth, uh, because Rome as a civilization and as a history of literature, it, it has an interesting relationship to myth. So we'll sort of discuss this through um, this kind of roundabout way. So talk about Romulus and Remus, this myth about Rome's founding, um, which it is uh, actually a myth. And then we'll think about Aeneas, this character who was fated to found Rome as um, depicted in Virgil's epic, the Aeneid, which is not really a myth. It's, it's, um, a, construction, it's a constructed history of the founding of Rome. So uh, th that'll make more sense later, perhaps. Um, but anyway, let's let's start off. So we ended last lecture thinking about Aristotle's definition of a tragic hero and if Antigone features within that definition. You know, does she really have a recognition scene where she comes to realize something she hadn't known in that way before? She, and she doesn't really. You know, all the other heroes we've been contemplating in the last few texts have these moments of recognition um, where they realize something. Um, <clears throat> but for Antigone, she seems very determined throughout her, her play. Um, also key to Aristotle's definition of a tragic hero is this sort of reversal of fortune. Um, a lot of the tragic heroes in the dramas we read have this kind of moment. The penultimate example is Oedipus where both of these moments are combined in the same, the same moment, um, where Oedipus realizes that he has already fulfilled his curse, and by realizing that, he realizes that he's doomed. Um, Antigone doesn't really have this. She's doomed from the beginning of her play. She doesn't fit Aristotle's definition. I sort of suggested this at the end of last uh, lecture, that I still believe Antigone is a hero. Um, in her in her drama. I mean, in fact, the drama is named Antigone. You know, compare the Aeschylus play Agamemnon, where the main character is really Clytemnestra, but she's not the hero. She's like the villain of the play. The hero might be, I don't know, maybe it's the memory of Agamemnon that is fallen, I suppose. I don't know. Anyway, but Antigone in her play, she does seem to be a hero, even though she doesn't fit Aristotle's definitions of, hero of heroism in in tragedy. She instead fits this other definition of hero that we discussed more often in Greek epic. So she refers to things like glory and how she's determined to live her life and suffer death even for glory. Um, she really reminds me of heroes in, in Greek epic. So um, I'm trying to kind of tease out the nuances of the definition of hero in the sort of Greek tradition. So in Greek tragedy, like Sophocles' Oedipus the King, um, or, or Aeschylus's The Eumenides, maybe Orestes might fit this, I suppose. It, really the best example is, is Sophocles' Oedipus. Um, so the heroes in Greek tragedy, they tend to fit Aristotle's definition. They have some sort of fatal flaw. They come to recognize the implications of that flaw and where it's led them wrong and um, doomed their fate in a reversal of fortune. So Sophocles' Oedipus fits this. Sophocles' Creon fits this to a certain extent. Other characters don't quite fit that so well. But instead, the female heroes of tragedy tend 
in a way, to be epic heroes tragically stuck in a woman's body. And that seems to be, to me at least, Antigone's f fate. She's a hero not because she um, realizes something truth truthful and profound and damning, but she's a hero because she's so committed to her pursuit of glory that is, in a sense, failed because she is a, is a female. But... Her definition of um, glory counts death as a success, so it's kind of interesting. And um, this tradition that Sophocles establishes with um, with Antigone, it it goes into um, other iterations under the next Greek playwright, great Greek playwright Euripides. Euripides in all of his plays, we won't read any of these, unfortunately. But if you read the Medea, the Bacchae, these plays um, center on these profoundly compelling female heroes who also suffer sort of tragic fates similar to Antigone that relate to their pursuit of, of this very epic and male virtue of, of glory. Anyway, I'm talking about all this now to introduce Rome because these issues will feature in Virgil's Aeneid. In a lot of ways, Virgil is drawing from various traditions as he constructs his foundational epic for Rome. The Aeneid. So before we start talking about the Aeneid specifically, I do want to give you a brief history of Rome. This image here is a map of the extent of the Roman Empire at its height with the names of the places in Latin. So uh, this is Ireland, you might recognize, Hibernia, um, Londinium is London, and you, you'll probably recognize other sorts of um, names uh, let's see here, Sicil Sicily, that's uh, um, <laughs> the Ionian Sea. I think these are these are um, names that still uh, exist, the Danube. Um, anyway, it's kind of interesting if you get interested in maps, so I'll, I'll, I won't say more about this. But um, yeah, Rome. So let's talk about some big moments in Roman history. This is very brief. So um, if you take, you could take a whole semester's or year's worth of class on Roman history. So um, you might want to do that in your future careers um, as students. But for right now, <laughs> we'll just do briefly some kind of heavy, heavy moments. Okay, this is the traditional founding date for Rome, 753 BC. We'll say a little bit more about that in the future. It might be mythic, a mythical founding date, because it's hard to prove when it was founded. Um... But just to compare, so Rome and its very uh, important rival, Carthage, this is a city in North Africa, they were founded about the same time. So this establishes this kind of very profound rivalry between these two uh, cities. So Rome in um, the middle of Italy, the southern part of the European continent, and then the very northern part of the African continent, Carthage, rivals. Okay, in the seventh century, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there are, were Greek colonies as far as Marseille in France and uh, uh, Cyrene in North Africa. So this is just showing that like, as Rome is being founded, the Greek empire is really the sort of powerful player in the region. Um, okay, let's keep going. So um, this is Roman, uh, 509 BC, the Roman king, so Rome starts off as a monarchy, like a lot of um, a lot of civilizations start off with a king, um, but in 509, the king is expelled. We'll say more about this in our next lecture, the, the myth surrounding the expulsion of the king. And um, after he is unseated from power, Rome becomes a republic. So um, a republic is a... Uh, the United States counts as a republic. It is um, a representative democracy where civilians vote for a representative to represent their interests in the seat of power. So um, that's what a republic is. Rome is one of those. Okay, uh, 551, Roman law codified in the 12 tablets. This is just an important moment for legal history. Um, Roman law is very important because it's the foundation for um, uh, law in France, law in England, law in America later too. So a lot of um, the laws that we still have actually have foundational um, connections back to Roman law. So codified just means written down. Okay, um, 323 BC. So this basically marks the end of the expansion and the height of the Greek Empire with the death of Alexander the Great. So 
um, at this moment, gr the Greek empire is going to continuously contract, um, leaving sort of a power vacuum that Rome will eventually uh, supplant. Okay, uh, 264, Rome controls south, Italy south of the river Po, uh, defeats Carthage at sea. This is really important. So, um, okay, so first off, uh, Rome is taking more territories outside of um, its, its walls as a city, and it's growing in military power. It defeats Carthage at sea. Um, remember, these two places are on either side of the Mediterranean, and so control of the Mediterranean um, is really important, and um, this is a great moment for Rome. Um, this is more expansion. Sicily becomes the first Roman province, so it's expanding. It's it's making provinces. Um, the rivalry continues with Carthage. Hannibal, this very great military leader of Carthage, he um, so Carthage is defeated at sea earlier. Hannibal gets this great idea to attack Rome from the land, so they invade Italy through the Alps, which was um, there's a lot written about this, so it's very exciting, but like Hannibal, you know, right, the myth of it, I don't know if this is actually true, but the, the story is um, he's riding elephants through the Alps, so this like African invading Italy. How horrifying this would be, you know, to have this like military superpower guy, um, you know, come at them from this direction they didn't anticipate. Um, so anyway, he, this is the attempt to capture Rome, 16 years of war, warfare, but ultimately Hannibal fails to capture Rome. So this is a very definitive victory for, for Rome. It kind of establishes uh, their supremacy as a power. Um, it kind of puts Carthage in its place a little bit as sort of secondary to Rome's power. Okay, um, as Rome continues to expand, it goes into um, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain becomes a province. Um, okay, this is where things get even more exciting in a lot of ways. So just before the, um, you know, BC, the birth of Christ, you know, supposedly, <laughs> um, there starts to be a social war in Italy. We'll say more about this in slides to continue. Um, Italians are granted Rome, Roman citizenship, which is great because now they can elect um, people to or the Republic. We're still a republic at this moment, but there's a social war, it becomes a civil war, even more intense. This civil war here, it eventually ends. So these are like decades of civil war. This particular one, um, outbreak of war, ends in a dictatorship by a military leader, Sulla. Um, so this is kind of interesting. This is the first time where a military leader seizes power away from the republic, but it doesn't last. Um, Rome is continually expanding at this time too. And then we, so Sulla is unseated, the, the Republic still stands um, until this moment kind of triggers what will become the fall of the Roman Republic. So Julius Caesar, a very um, capable, very effective military leader, uh, was, he was, you know, he's out conquering more territory for Rome. The Republic likes this, you know, great, more territory is always good. Um, he conquers Gaul. Gaul is um, the sort of catch-all name for uh, the sort of um, region between France and Germany, including a lot of France and Germany. There's also regions in um, Spain that I think might count as Gaul, like Galicia has, you know, comes from the same name as Gaul. Anyway, the Republic, people in power, the Republic, uh, told Julius Caesar not to cross a particular river because doing so um, would imply further Roman expansion. Um, instead of listening to them and in honoring their authority, Ju Julius Caesar crosses that river and in doing so signals that he is more authoritative than the Republic. So he breaks the law and in, in doing so, um, you know, a lot of people are supporting him because he's such an effective leader. He eventually translates that military leadership and power into political power by becoming a dictator in... Um, 47 BC. We don't call him an emperor yet because it's not um, legitimate. But so again, a dictatorship similar to Sulla's. But um, the Republicans conspire to murder Julius Caesar uh, in 44 BC. In the um, aftermath of this move, the assassination of Julius Caesar, um, there's a lot more instability. Notice that there's like, uh, so 44 to 27, that's... Um, 
17 years. So 17 years of more political and, and military instability, social war, civil war. Eventually, um, stability is attained through Octavian, who is the nephew of Julius Caesar. He steps up, he names himself, he basically crowns himself the emperor he, and names himself Augustus. So Octa Octavian is the same person as Augustus. Augustus is Latin for like the grand one, like super grand. So he um, basically crowns himself and establishes Rome as an empire. So at this point, the, um, the Republic is no longer in existence. We're an empire now. And then the last bit I'll say is um, it's interesting that at this pretty much the same moment is the origin of what will become uh, Christianity. So circa um, 6, I believe this is 6 BC, birth of, of Christ. Okay, so this was a lot of information, but I hope that this, you kind of get a feeling for um, the sort of like historical trajectory of Rome from a monarchy to a republic to, a, to an empire. It has a lot of interesting kind of political moments as it expands as a, as a as a nation and empire. Um, I'm also showing you like visually, like all of this political history existed. And then these two bullet points refer to Rome's foundational literary history. So um, Virgil, the author of the Aeneid was born in 70 BC. So around the time that, uh, so around here, just before uh, Julius Caesar, you know, so he was an adult by the time Julius Caesar is conquering Gaul. So that's pretty interesting. He's been thinking about him um, as a, you know, a living person during this profoundly tumultuous time in history of Rome. And then 43 BC, the next uh, writer we'll be reading is Ovid. He is a generation younger than Virgil. And so um, these two men had a profoundly different experience of um, political history. And you can see that represented in their in their writings. So we'll be able to say more about this in the coming lectures, but okay. So okay, let's talk about the rise of the Republic. Like how the rise of Rome, that is, how it translates from transforms from a republic to an empire. So what was it about Rome that allowed it to gain so much power so so quickly and so effectively? Okay, so Romans basically they're just really adept at um, incorporating other cultures without um, totally oppressing them. So they have a profound appreciation for other cultures. They incorporate other cultures into Rome while still allowing many of those cultures to, um, to practice their religion and um, practices and stuff like that. They're just Roman now. And so that's kind of um, broad brush strokes. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of exceptions to what I just said there, but for the most part, this is what allows Rome to expand because it's it's not provoking a lot of rebellions. Yeah. Like if you conquer people and then are ruthlessly cruel to them, eventually they're going to rebel against that. But Rome, Romans don't, they're not, they're not exceptionally cruel or anything. They just kind of let people kind of retain their cultures. Okay, so um, as Rome is expanding, um, this expansion is really, really good for the economy. It leads to the rise of a middle class. And this is true for many economies now, that um, you know, as you gain more territory, there's more um, resources to exploit, more ways to make money for more people. So a middle class starts rising. Um, but this often happens too in a lot of cultures. As a middle class starts rising, eventually there becomes a point where the rise of the middle class actually leads to political instability because this new class of people are growing in economic and then uh, by implication political power. So they're rivals to these sort of established um, elite ruling classes. So the middle class starts to challenge the power of like the aristocratic, uh, the aristocratic class, um, eventually leading to civil war. So this is how the civil wars come out of the time of the Republic because um, Republicans, people elected to the Republic would have been of a, of a more elite um, class. And so the middle class, sort of nouveau riche, I guess you might say, or bourgeois, bourgeoisie, I guess, they start to um, rival the elites for power. The elites don't like that. Um, civil war break, breaks out. Eventually, someone rises to, to provide, provide stability. Um, 
but you know before before the dictators kind of come up um uh as the middle class rises eventually there becomes a tipping point where like some people are able to amass more and more and more wealth and power and then they displace um the poor uh, on the land that they come to own and so um you know but how it's what i'm saying here basically is um this trajectory of the rise of the middle class leading to um, the gap between rich and poor widening, this goes hand in hand with the Roman um, the Roman capitalization of uh, slavery, basically. So um, as people become more rich and gain more and more land, they can basically transition a sort of peasant-based economy towards one that's based on slaves. So the wealthy uh, landowners can buy slaves. Often these slaves in the Roman Empire come from conquer, conquering people. You can enslave the, the people that you conquer, take them back to your land, and then basically not refuse to pay them. But um, as you have a labor force where you're not paying them, this is really economically efficient for the landowners. Um, but of course, slaves would displace the peasants. So um, the peasants on the land who used to have a job, now don't because they're being out, um, outpaced by, uh, well, they're being like outsourced by slave, slave labor. So the peasants uh, move to the cities. They become these huge populations of urban poor in the major cities of Rome. And then this contributes even more to the gap between rich and poor widening. So things are getting kind of like really um, unstable potentially here. Uh, but then the, the emperor takes over providing some stability. So as an empire, Romans were really, really good at conquest. They're also really good at management and infrastructure report, uh, sorry, infrastructure support. So this goes uh, connected to this first bullet point. Um, this is another reason why territories who were conquered don't rebel against Rome because the Romans were super good at building cities, basically. So um, just as an example for this, uh, lots of aqueducts were built throughout the Roman Empire. So this is um, in Gaul. I believe this is probably part of France, maybe Switzerland, I suppose. But um, at the time, it was in the Gaul part of Rome. This is the highest aqueduct of the empire. But like, look, I mean, this is still standing today. This is like a pretty marvelous example of, um, you know, urban planning. This is providing a way for uh, water to be transported across um, very vast distances. Okay, so how does Rome fall? Um, so it's very stable for a long time. This is the time period referred to as the five good emperors, these very stable and um, peaceful uh, emperors. But as this typically happens too, as um, lives become easier to live, people can kind of uh, lose sight of the sort of virtue of struggle, and so that the sort of political um, and economic ease can lead to a sort of like spiritual vapidity. This is what people say, at least. Um, and this uh, this kind of explains why a religion like Christianity, which is a religion of, of slaves, um, would rise. Uh, so um, Christianity kind of t comes in this sort of vacuum of um, a spiritual meaning. And so people become very devout in their religion. Um, and then eventually Christianity will event will become a source of political stability for the Roman region. Um, but after Rome falls, so I'm kind of skipping over a lot of things here, Rome eventually has some kind of less peaceful emperors. Um, Rome will eventually fall. But as after it falls, the blueprint of the Western world state remained in the wake of Rome's fall. So even after it fell, people remembered what Rome was because they had such a vast influence. And so um, this sort of idea of what was possible remained. And in that sort of, um, in the blueprint of that fallen empire, we have this other political body that rises to kind of take over a little bit. Um, so this is not exactly a political, uh, a politically led um, power although it has political aspects to it, but a religiously led power. So um, the medieval church centered at Rome, uh, the Vatican, would envelop the geographic region and reach that the Roman Empire also had at one point. So the sort of like transfer of power sort of exists here. Um, and then one thing to keep in mind is the power of the Catholic Church is part of the reason 
both Rome and Greek culture survived. So when any empire falls, think of ancient Babylon. Um, when, when any empire falls, it, it's possible to lose all that literature and all that culture. Um, remember, the Epic of Gilgamesh was buried for centuries, for millennia. Um, but the Catholic Church, because it kind of rose up to take over the sort of vacuum left by the fall of Rome, they were able to retain the sort of um, cultural artifacts of Rome and then therefore Greek culture as well. And this is why, in the West at least, the sort of Roman and Greek uh, literature is so important because it was so, um, so carefully preserved by the Church. Um, also, it, I should also mention that um, Islamic power, centers of power also um, protected these works of literature. And um, the Eastern Orthodox branch of Christianity also were this kind of like bastion for this culture as well. So um, we wouldn't have a lot of what we were reading in this class if not for um, religious institutions. Um, so that's kind of interesting, potentially. Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> One thing to kind of keep in mind, um, the reason why I'm going through all this history is because um, of this, this fact here that Rome, so Rome is a city, but I put it in quotation marks here because it's also sort of an idea. Romans were almost from the inception of what Rome was. They were creating what it meant to be Roman. The cre they were creating what it meant to be Rome. Um, so this is sort of uh, one way of looking at it. Greek history, what we know about ancient Greece, begins with epic poetry. The first, the earliest examples of what it means to be Greek are recorded in works of literature. Hesiod, Homer, you guys read these works. But with Rome, Rome as a political body conquered half the known world before it turned to literature. So um, there's a way in which the sort of artists thinking about Rome, they already knew, um, they had a sense of the importance of what Rome was politically, militarily, economically, and they wanted to embed their literature with that, those senses of the importance of Rome. So there's like a, there's a very self-conscious kind of understanding of what, what it means to be a part of Rome embedded in Roman literature. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me know if you have questions about that. So, um, yeah, Rome's literature is much more self-conscious. Rome is, in a sense, creating ro Rome, like what it means. Okay, so um, now I'm going to transition to this myth about Rome. There are uh, some myths about Rome. You know, um, when we were reading uh, Homer's works, Homer, as a poet, is rehashing and kind of like riffing on Greek myth. He doesn't come up with the myths, but he comes up with stories about the myths. Like he's playing with the myths that he inherited from his culture, and he's creating great works of literature surrounding these, these mythical stories. So there are some mythical stories associated with Rome, and here's one of the most important ones, uh, one of the most well-known ones. The myth of the founding of Rome by brothers Romulus and Remus. Romulus is the founder of Rome, you can tell, because his name, Romulus Rome. Okay, so um, here's sort of like an artistic representation <laughs> of the Romulus and Remus myth. You might know this myth. Um, basically, these two boys are preserved in the wilderness by a wolf who suckles them. She-wolf. Uh, this is a... For a while, people thought that this was really old. Um, they thought it was dated to the 5th century BC, but actually uh, carbon dating... <laughs> proved that it was at, this is a 13th century AD um, piece of work, but it, it just goes to show you that like, even in the past, people were trying to create art that seemed antique. Anyway, okay. Okay, here's the Romulus Remus myth, here's the gist. Okay, so first off, um, critics today are still debating over like where this, where this myth originated. Like, was it always a myth? and it's like difficult to find an original moment of it, or did someone just make it up? It's possible someone made it up. Um, in fact, this is where the founding date of uh, 753 AD, it's something like April 19th or something, April 19th, 753 BC. Um, that's what uh, I think it's Herodotus said. Anyway, but anyway, debates are still happening over this myth. Okay, but here is the myth. These two twin boys, 
had, um, they were born to this Vestal Virgin. <sighs> this doesn't make a lot of sense, virgins having babies. I mean, if you're a raised Christian, you might, it might make more sense. Mary's a virgin and she had a baby. Okay, so here's a similar story. There's this virgin um, who somehow is impregnated and has twins. Uh, the, the origin of the story, perhaps she was raped by a god. In some cases, it's Mars. In some cases, it's like a king or something. Anyway, I think she was a princess too because um, when she gives birth, uh, the king of the land is threatened by these two twin boys. And so he forces the girl to abandon the twins in the wilderness. This will remind you of a lot of stories we've read. Think of uh, Rama's two boys. That they're also twins, abandoned in the wilderness. Um, Oedipus, abandoned in the wilderness. Anyway, so the king tries to expose the two twins. However, there's this she-wolf who um, finds the boys and lets them drink from her um, milk. And uh, so she raises them a little bit. And then a shepherd eventually finds them and raises them as his sons. These two boys are very, um, they're like, they're very driven. <laughs> they decide to found a new city. And... Um, they are very rivalrous as well. They quarrel over the site of the new city that they're going to found. Um, Romulus, one of the brothers, decides that he's going to found the city around this hill, Palatine Hill. He builds a wall around this hill. His brother is kind of a jerk. He starts making fun of Romulus's wall. So Romulus kills Remus. Like, don't make fun of my wall. I'm going to kill you. And so after he kills his brother, you know, he wins the rivalry and he names the city after himself, Roma, from Romulus. Um, okay, here's the founding date. The founding date of Rome, April 21st, sorry, I got that wrong, <laughs> April 21st, 753 BC, according to Livy. Um, however, this might be suspect because Livy wrote this myth down um, in the 3rd century BC, so how does he exactly know? Anyway, debate, debate. So yeah, I was doubly wrong. It's not, it wasn't Herodotus, that's a, I think he's a Greek historian. Livy is a, a historian of Rome. Okay, here's a picture of kind of contemporary Palatine Hill. It's this kind of, it's not even a huge hill or anything, but it's, you know, it's like a cute little hill. Um, but you can go here and it's kind of like the Acropolis in a, in a way because it has a lot of sort of like very important um, buildings on it. And so if you go visit Rome, you can see this. It's the most ancient part of the city. It's the site at which Romulus kills Remus and founds the city. That's something to kind of think about, that the city is founded in uh, fratricide. Mm, kind of interesting. Okay, another quarrel, a quarreling brother pair. Uh, here's sort of a, just a map of the city of Rome. So the center is Palatine Hill. Uh, Rome is famous for having seven hills. So here are all the hills. So if you go to Rome, apparently you can like look at all the hills, I guess. Anyway, but note um, the city is next to a river. River is very important for um, expansion. The Vatican eventually will come over here. Anyway, this is Rome. <laughs> okay, Romulus and Remus. So this myth is referenced in Virgil's Aeneid. So um, Virgil, in writing his work of literature, his epic, he is trying to establish kind of legitimacy for his epic through reference to this myth that already existed. So Virgil connects the Romulus and Remus myth to, its, to his founding myth, so in book six, this is a book where um, Aeneas goes into the underworld. He visits people who have died, including his own father. So Anchises, his dad, tells Aeneas that he will father many, many sons who will go on to, to found Rome. So um, uh, Anchises says, Come, what glories follow Darden generations and after years, and from Italian blood, what famous children in your line will come? Souls of the future are living in our name. I shall clearly tell you now, and in telling you, and sorry, and in, in the telling, teach you your destiny. So this dead father telling his son of the many famous children in his line that he will father. Um, so if, this is a long speech. She's telling all sorts of people he'll father um, who are like historical and mythical figures of Rome. Um, uh, Anchises mentions Romulus, fathered by Mars in this version. Um, so this is kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, like, Virgil is referring to an actual founding myth of Rome in his kind of made-up founding myth of Rome. So he's 
the the Aeneid is um, fan fiction for the most part. It is um, a creation by Virgil. But in this creation, he is referring to actual founding myths and adapting Greek and um, Greek myths and Greek literature into his sort of like fan fiction moment. Okay, so this goes well into um, kind of introducing the Aeneid. So it's this foundational epic of Rome. So what I mean by that is in Virgil's Aeneid, Virgil is intentionally creating an epic for Rome, one to rival and surpass the Greek epics that Virgil grew up reading and learning. And um, the topic of this epic is Rome's founding by the great hero Aeneas. Okay, so um, a little bit about the Aeneid. It's often considered a tribute to Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. So this is Octavian, this is Julius Caesar's nephew, the first emperor. However, I will be arguing in this lecture and the next that the poem, it celebrates Augustus, but it also critiques him. So we'll kind of talk about that, that this epic is not just a celebration. It's an epic of nation building. So a, literally the building of Rome as a nation. It's an epic of birthright. Um, a birthright is sort of rights that you are, um, rights that are natural to expect because you were born to have them. So, um, you know, in the sort of American tradition, the American birthright is like your right to pursue um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or whatever. You're, those are birthrights where our rights are life, liberty, freedom, and pursuing happiness. Um, lots of nations have birthrights, you know, things that they are born to do by nature of being from that nation. Okay, so um, this is kind of creating a story about Rome's birthright, like what they are entitled to do by nature of being Roman. Uh, Aeneid, the Aeneid links the grandeur of Rome with the legacy of Troy. So how this birthright comes to be is that Aeneas comes from Troy to build Rome. So because he withstood the tragedy of Troy, the fall of Troy, in, as depicted in Homer's Iliad and in Greek myth, because he withstood that and survived, Aeneas is, um, he has the right to found this new nation with the glory of Troy behind him, kind of. So um, this is what Virgil's project is. In the Aeneid, he basically comp combines the Odyssey with the Iliad. So books one through six of the Aeneid are um, they're kind of like a mini Odyssey. They're like uh, Aeneas, after he leaves Troy, he's like wandering forever, trying to find a good place to start a new home. He's a bit like um, Odysseus. In this, uh, in this epic, Odys where, so like in the Odyssey where Odysseus is, um, he's cursed by Poseidon because we, we remember all this, uh, Odysseus blinds Poseidon's son, Polythenus. Um, in the Aeneid, Aeneas is cursed to wander because Juno or Hera, the Greek goddess, Hera is the Roman goddess Juno. Um, Juno hates Aeneas. So remember that Hera always hated Troy. She was always on the side of the Greeks. Aeneas is a Trojan. So therefore in the Roman version, Juno, Hera, um, hates Aeneas and she doesn't want him to found Rome. And then the second half of the, the epic uh, is kind of like the Iliad part of the book. It's um, a very great epic of war. The Achaeans, so the Greeks against the Trojans in Homer's Iliad become the Trojans against the Latins. So like the, the displaced warriors from Troy invade Italy and they fight against the sort of established um, political people there, the Latins. Um, this time the Trojans win, where they lost before. Okay, uh, another thing to keep in mind is that the Aeneid was unfinished at Virgil's death. So we don't know exactly if this is how he wanted it to end. We'll talk about the ending of the Aeneid, which is rather interesting. But um, he never finished it. And it's an epic also intended mostly to be read. Latin is a really complicated language. It's not very conversational, although people did speak it. It's um it's a language though that was largely written, so like for official documentations. And so um, when Virgil writes his epic in Latin, it's um yeah, it's meant to be 
like read and kind of like studied. So as you read, you might find it a little bit difficult to read. You might need to kind of reread parts of it. Um, but that's kind of the nature of Latin. It's a very difficult language. Okay, here's the opener of the Aeneid. It's quite similar to a lot of the openers that um, you are familiar with from the Greek tradition, and that's intentional. Maybe one thing I'll say here too is, you know, when Virgil writes the Aeneid and combines the Odyssey and Iliad, the sort of tacit argument he's making is that the Epic of Rome is even better than the Epics of Greece because it combines both of them, both of the very famous ones in one. So Virgil's kind of trying to, you know, create like the epic, you know, and it's a Roman epic. Okay, Arms of the Man I Sing. So here's like, this is a very famous translation of the opening line. I put that here just because um, you might see this in, uh, you might see it elsewhere, but uh, our translator translates the first line a little differently. But so I'll read this aloud. Think of all the things that it reminds you of as I read it. I sing of warfare and a man at war. From the sea coast of Troy in early days, he came to Italy by destiny, to our Lavinian western shore, a fugitive, this captain buffeted cruelly on land as on the sea by blows from powers of the air, behind them baleful Juno in her sleepless rage. And cruel losses were his lot in war, till he could found a city and bring home his gods to Latium, land of the Latin race, the Alban lords, and the high walls of Rome. Tell me the causes now, O muse. So this is a classic invocation to the muses. Virgil is taking the tradition of Greek, of the Greek epics, the invocation to the muses, and applying them to his Roman epic. So he's kind of like, basically he's saying that like the tradition of Greece and its sort of power and height and importance, Rome has that too, and I'm incorporating all that. Um, and in fact, we see this here too. He's going to found a city and bring home his gods to Latium. And this is what Rome, uh, what the Romans do. They basically translate all of the Greek gods into Latin gods. So it can get kind of confusing, but it's the reason why the goddess of love, Aphrodite in Greek, is also called Venus in a lot of traditions. Venus is her Roman name. And so this is true of all the gods. They all have Greek names and Roman names. Um, Anyway, so this is um, largely the, the Roman uh, establishment of its culture as inherited from the, from the Greeks, but not copied, enhanced. So Romans always think that they can do it better. Okay. All right, yeah, here's Juno, sleepless rage. Okay, she hates Aeneas. Notice that Aeneas isn't named for a long, long time. It's, it's a he. This is a bit like um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know. He who saw the deep, till he could found a city. Eventually they'll name him. Okay, why does Virgil link Rome to Troy? In book two, Aeneas tells the story of the fall of Troy to Dido. So think of this question. Why is he doing this? Why is he linking Rome to Troy? So as I read this, this is Aeneas telling the story of Rome's fall to Dido, the queen of Carthage, who we'll meet in our reading. Okay, so Dido's like, tell me where you came from, handsome stranger. Um, why are you so sad? He goes, sorrow too deep to tell your majesty. You order me to feel and tell once more how the Danans leveled in the dust the splendor of our mourned forever kingdom. Heartbreaking things I saw with my own eyes and was myself a part of. Who could tell them? Even, even a Myrmidon or a Dilopian or Ruffian of Ulysses without tears. Now too the night is well along with dew fall out of heaven and setting stars way down our heads towards sleep. But if so great desire moves you to hear the tale of our disasters, briefly recalled, the final throes of Troy, however I may shudder at the memory and shrink again in grief, let me begin. So this is going to be a terrible story for him to tell because it's the story of his city's fall, but he'll, he'll tell it. Notice that, um, uh, that this would be a difficult story even for Greeks to tell. So it's, it's the story of how the Danans, or the Greeks, leveled in the dust the splendor of our mourned forever kingdom. This is a great, this is a great name for Troy. Because Troy, from its inception in myth, has always been mourned forever. You know, it's like always fallen, always mourned. Um, and then he says, even a Myrmidon or Dilopian or Ruffian of Ulysses, who could tell this story without tears? Even these guys would cry. 
uh, Myrmidon, you might you might remember this. Uh, the Myrmidons were the followers of Achilles, so they're Greeks. Uh, I forget who Dilopians are, but they're also Greeks. And then a ruffian of Ulysses. Ulysses is the Roman name for Odysseus. Uh, so all of these Greek warriors would also cry when they speak about the fall of Troy. Um, so their pain is not e it can't be rivaled by Aeneas's pain, Aeneas being a son of Troy. Anyway, so why is, Rome, why is Virgil doing this? Why link Rome to a legacy of losing, a legacy of mournful, a mournful kingdom that's been lost? This is, in a sense, kind of connected to um, the idea of birthright. The sort of suggestion is that because Aeneas and Trojans suffered so much in the fall of their city, Aeneas deserves to be um, celebrated. He deserves to found Rome. He deserves to found a new kingdom. It's kind of interesting. Okay, we'll say probably more about this to, to <laughs> in the, the days to continue. The, the days that continue, that is. Um, so through Aeneas, Virgil is actually creating a new kind of epic hero. So he's building on the traditions of the past with epic heroes, but creating new, new version. So um, in, a, in a sense, he's a bit like Achilles. His father is mortal, Anchises. His mother is divine. So where Ach Achilles had a mother, Thetis, um, Aeneas' mother is Venus. He's, his mother is the goddess of love. Wow. Okay. Um, he carries his father and son to Italy to found a new kingdom. So Achilles died in his epic. Well, he doesn't really die in the Iliad, but he dies in the myth of the fall of Troy. Um, but Aeneas doesn't die. He's fated to survive. And in fact, through the destruction of Troy, he is um, kind of empowered to found a new kingdom. So he's not exactly the best warrior like Achilles. He doesn't die with his homeland like Hector. He doesn't return home like Odysseus. He wanders like Odysseus, but he doesn't get back home. His home doesn't exist. Instead, he founds a new kingdom. He survives the tragedy of Troy and the struggle to find home through colonization. So Aeneas is a colonizer. So his glory is linked to Rome's burgeoning glory. Um, and uh, yeah, that's exactly, you know, that's the, the sort of new kind of epic hero here. It's sort of associating with heroism, not with return like Odysseus, or not with um, glorious death like Achilles and Hector, but with colonizing a new home. So it's very Roman. Rome loves to expand, it loves, loves conquest, it loves colonization. Here's a colonizer hero, basically. Okay, um, so in the tradition of Aeneas depicted, um, he's often depicted as like this family man here. So here, like, this is him, this, this is the ruins of Troy, this, uh, you know, Troy falling, it's on fire. His wife, who will die soon, leaving him single, which is, you know, useful for our story. <laughs> um, they all try as a family to escape. Uh, the wife perishes, but eventually Aeneas is able to carry his father, Anchises, and his baby son here to found a new kingdom at Rome. Uh, so here's another more contemporary um, depiction of Aeneas here. Again, he's with his little son. He's holding his hand. Notice, I mean, he doesn't, like have, he doesn't have like a bow and arrow. He's got a pig. <laughs> he's an agricultural family man, homestead kind of hero. Okay, so again, this question, why does Virgil link Rome to Troy? So here's where I'm kind of planting the seeds for the fact that I think the Aeneid is um, uh, a critique as well as a celebration of Rome and Aeneas. So, um, so one thing that Virgil does is he gives us a new perspective on things that happened in the, Ili in the Iliad. So the fall of Troy, uh, work of literature, the liter work of literature about the fall of Troy. We're given a new perspective, two new perspectives on it uh, by hearing what Aeneas says about the fall of Troy. So um, first we hear him describe the death of Priam um, in this very interesting way. So Priam is uh, fated in the myth to die by Achilles' son Neoptolemus. The Roman name for Neoptolemus is Pyrrhus, by the way. Um, when Aeneas tells the story of the death of Priam, this is his king of course, Aeneas is very critical of Neoptolemus for his brutal killing of Priam especially after what happens in the Iliad, as you guys read. So remember like how 
much Priam is celebrated in the Aeneid, sorry, in the Iliad. Even though he's on the losing side of the war, Achilles pities Priam, Achilles helps Priam, he gives Hector, Hector's body back to Priam. Anyway, he's very celebrated. Um, and so when Priam is murdered by Achilles' son, this is not good. It's horrible. And then, um, so even though Aeneas is critical of Neoptolemus for killing Priam, this pitiful old man, Aeneas will actually act very similarly to Neoptolemus later in the Aeneid. Another thing that we get another perspective on, Helen's fate after the Trojan War, before returning to Menelaus, we get a new perspective on this. Aeneas is very critical of Helen for causing the war. He hates her. In fact, he thinks about killing her. But Aeneas will act very similarly to Helen later. So there's this way in which that the new perspective that we're given on the Iliad and the Greek works of old, um, these new perspectives kind of complicate the story of Rome. So there's a way in which this is both a celebration and a critique of what Rome, Rome is and who Aeneas is as the founder of Rome. Okay, so here's um, a depiction. Um, I'm, I'll wrap up pretty soon, but here's a sort of contemporary-ish uh, depiction of the death of Priam by Neoptolemus, Achilles' son. Um, <clears throat> note here, and this is typical of the depictions of the death of Priam. It's always depicted pretty much as a tragedy um, from, the, from the Trojan perspective. This is the king, the very respectful and respected king of, Tro of Troy, this old man, killed by a very strong young man. Like that's lacking pity, the pitiless uh, murder. Um, we did hear Odysseus celebrate Neoptolemus for murdering Priam. But that's usually against, that tradition is usually, um, is usually kind of mourned that Priam had to die. Um, here is the depiction of Prius killing Pri uh, sorry Pyrrhus killing Priam in the Aeneid. So Neoptolemus again is um, the same person as Pyrrhus. This is the Roman name. Okay. Uh, so I'll read this. This is a part in Aeneas's story to Dido. Um, basically, it's Neopt uh, Neoptolemus or Pyrrhus has come upon Priam and is preparing to kill him. Um, Priam tries to stand up to Pyrrhus, but he fails because he's a, he's a weak old man, basically. Um, but he tries to scold Pyrrhus as an older gentleman. He, you know, older people are always scolding young people for acting badly. <laughs> okay, so this is Priam speaking. So for what you, Pyrrhus, have done, for what you dared, Priam said, if there is care in heaven for atrocity, may the gods render fitting thanks, reward you as you deserve. You forced me to look on the destruction, to look on at the destruction of my son, defiled a father's eyes with death. That great Achilles you claim to be the son of, and you lie, was not like you to Priam, his enemy. To me, who threw myself upon his mercy. So this is he's referring to the plot of the Iliad, when Priam throws himself at the mercy of Achilles. So to me, who threw himself upon his mercy. Achilles showed compunction, gave me back for burial the bloodless corpse of Hector, and returned me to my own realm. So basically he's saying, your dad was a better person than you. The old man threw his spear with feeble impact, blocked by the ringing bronze. It hung there harmless from the jutting boss. Then Pyrrhus answered, you'll report the news to Peleides, my father. Don't forget my sad behavior, the degeneracy of Neoptolemus. Now die. Basically, he's saying, go to hell. <laughs> Report this news to my father, who's dead in hell, <laughs> basically, in the underworld. Yeah, this is kind of like very rude as a young man to say to an old, old, old man. Okay, so report the news to my father, now die. With this, to the altar step itself, he dragged him trembling. So this is Pyrrhus dragging Priam trembling, slipping in the pooled blood of his son, and took him, so by the way, um, Pyrrhus has just killed another of Priam's sons here. And so Pyrrhus drags Priam through the blood of one of Priam's sons. Yikes. Okay. So slipping the pooled blood of his son and took him by the hair with his left hand, the sword flashed in his right up to the hilt. He thrust it in his body. Um, that was the end of Priam's age. 
the doom that took him off with Troy in flames before his eyes, his towers headlong fallen. He that in other days had ruled in pride so many lands and peoples, the power of Asia. On that distant shore, the vast trunk headless lies without a name. So, yeah. So this is a story told by um, Aeneas. Of course, he's mourning for Troy here, mourning for Priam. And this is this very um, eloquent celebration of what Priam and Troy represented. Um, the end of Priam's age. So the, the age of this glorious hero, and the age of the glory of Troy. And he ruled and pride so many lands and peoples, the power of Asia. And um, this kind of young jerk, Achilles' son, Neoptolemus Pyrrhus, he treats this old man um, so poorly, not only dragging him through the blood of his son, but he, he basically stabs him. So he grabs his hair and then stabs him up to the hilt of the sword. That's like the full length of the sword goes into this man's body. Yikes, it's really bad. And then it does seem kind of suggesting that um, he also decapitates the corpse. The vast trunk headless lies without a name. This could, it might, maybe it's not a decapitation. Maybe it's like a metaphor for um, when Troy falls, when the king of Troy falls, the Asia is um, the shore living without a head. So like the city is living without um, an authority. Or perhaps it's Priam's body without its head. Okay, so um, here note how critical Aeneas is of Pyrrhus or Neoptolemus. We'll actually see Achilles, it's not Achilles, but Aeneas acting very, very similarly to Pyrrhus here, where he like stabs this weak old person, basically. Okay, so that's enough here. So it's foreshadowing what's to come. Um, here's another moment where foreshadowing happens that I think is expected or intended to be critical of Aeneas. So in the fall of Troy, so this is again when Aeneas is discussing the fall of Troy, he's telling the story to Dido. He comes to this moment where he encounters Helen. And um, think about how Helen would feel at the fall of Troy. She'd be probably terrified, assuming that a Trojan might want to kill her or a Greek might want to kill her too, because she's basically seen as the cause of the whole conflict. And now everyone's dying, so they would probably want a target for their rage and, and fear. And the same goes for Aeneas. He sees Helen and he wants to punish her. He wants to kill her. But his mother, Venus, intercedes. So here's the moment as he relates it. It came to this, that I stood there alone, and then I saw lurking beyond the dorsal, dorsal of the Vesta, Vestal Virgin, in hiding, silent, in that place reserved, the daughter of Tyndareus. This is Helen. Her father's Tyndareus. Glare of fires lighted my steps this way and that, my eyes glancing over the whole scene everywhere. That woman, terrified of the Trojans' hate for the city overthrown, terrified, too, of Dane and vengeance, her abandoned husband's anger after years. Helen, that fury, both to her own homeland and Troy, had gone to earth a hated thing before the altars. Now fires blazed up in my own spirit, a passion to avenge my fallen town and punish Helen's whorishness. Um, interesting things here. Note that he calls Helen a fury. So referring to the, the Furies, these vengeful female goddesses of the home, crimes against the home. So Helen is kind of one of those, perhaps, maybe. Um, he wants to punish her for being a whore, basically. Uh, yikes. Everyone hates her, too. Um, Trojans hate her. The Danans or the Greeks hate her, too. He hates her. He wants to punish her. Okay, so ran my thoughts. I turned wildly upon her, but at that moment, clear before my eyes, never before so clear in a pure light, Stepping before me, radiant through the night, my loving mother came, immortal, tall, and lovely as the lords of heaven know her. Catching me by the hand, she held me back, then with her rose-red mouth reproved me. Son, why let such suffering goad you on to fury past control? So note the fury thing here too. She's like, don't repay fury with fury. You'll just add to the suffering. She stops him from killing Helen. And um, he does. He doesn't kill her. Uh, very, very interesting. If we think about Venus in this situation, Venus, again, is the goddess Aphrodite. Here's a representation, much later representation, of um, this scene. Aeneas wanting so much to kill this woman, Helen, 
and Venus interceding, because she has a vested interest in both of these humans. Remember, Helen is one of her favorite humans because of um, her beauty. Uh, Aeneas would be one of her fav favorite because he's her son. And so this is rather interesting that love gets in the way and stops, um, stops vengeance and danger and stuff like that, stops violence. So yeah, she's a personification of love here. Also a mother. Okay, so <laughs> this is interesting um, because it also plant, plants a seed of um, foreshadowing for some of the behavior that Aeneas will partake of. Here he's so critical of Helen for how she acts and how she brings destruction on his people. He will act very similarly. Inspired by love, um, he'll act similarly in bringing destruction on someone that he loves. So here's the question. So as you continue reading, think about this. Is the Aeneid a celebration or critique of Aeneas, of Rome, of Augustus? In some ways it very much is and in some ways it doesn't. It doesn't celebrate, it critiques. So things to keep in mind. So just to repeat what I said before, Aeneas is very critical of Neoptolemus or Pyrrhus, Achilles' son, who mercilessly kills Priam, king of Troy. Aeneas will act like Neoptolemus, Pyrrhus later. Aeneas is very critical of Helen, the wife of Menelaus, who leaves Menelaus for Paris and starts the Trojan War. Aeneas will very much act like Helen later too. Okay, so keep those things in mind. Read the rest of the Aeneas, Aeneid excerpts I've given you, posted on NYU Brightspace. Here's kind of a brief summary of the books left to read. Book four, Dido and Aeneas fall in love. So after he tells her the story of Troy, he falls in love with her, she falls in love with him. It's kind of interesting and beautiful, but also very tragic. Um, in book six, Aeneas goes to the underworld. Compare this moment to the underworld in the Odyssey when Odysseus visits the underworld and confronts people from his past. Aeneas will do the same. Um, in book eight, there is the description of the shield of Aeneas described. So this is kind of like the moments when the Iliad section takes over. This should be compared to book 18 of the Iliad where the shield of Achilles is described. And then in book 12, the final book you'll read, um, the death of Turnus, who's the head of the Latin army. Compare, compare the death of Hector by Achilles in the Iliad book 22. You should also compare the death of Priam by Neoptolemus. Okay, more next time.